This is episode number 118, featuring the artist Richard Oversmith. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called plein air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it plein air. Others say plain air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping. Jim Kipping is our amazing announcer. Uh, Jim, uh, you're doing a great job. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric Rhodes, and it's great to be alive. I'm here in Austin, Texas, and it is blue bonnet season, and there have been fields and fields of blue carpet, blue wildflowers, also orange ones, uh, kind of like California, you know, just amazing wildflower season. I went out this past weekend, have a guest in town, Eric Johnson, the artist from Boston, who's visiting, who is doing this amazing video on how to paint like Rembrandt. He's kind of figured out all of Rembrandt's secrets. Anyway, we're doing one to celebrate Rembrandt's birthday. So anyway, we went up into the mountains. We painted overlooking this vast valley with these purple plateaus in the distance, it was uh, like a cowboy movie scene, and it was really wonderful, and blue bonnets in the foreground. And then the last mi minutes, the last 10 minutes, the gold light lit up the trees, and the mountains turned pink, and it was really awesome. Anyway, I love this life of plein air painting. Speaking of love and life, we're down to the wire on the plein air convention. Uh, talk about loving, having a good time. It's going to be like a love it, I guess, because it's San Francisco hippie time. We're going to be doing a, a hippie dance on the closing night, which is going to be kind of fun. Bring your your uh, bell bottoms and your wigs and your beads. And, of course, it's homecoming, so we're going to have a lot of fun in San Francisco. For those of you who were freaked out about driving in traffic in San Francisco and decided not to come, you can still change your mind. We've got buses, although you do need to get signed up for those buses in advance. We're up to four buses already and uh, might have some more depending but get signed up now because you don't want to forget uh, because if you don't get those buses before you go we don't have any extra bus seats for you we're painting four amazing spots including two that have incredible views of the bay and the golden gate bridge and some other really terrific areas uh, it's all landscapes it's not city painting and we have a faculty of 88 top painters to work with you and to teach you during the day. But time's running out. Sign up at the uh, website, plenairconvention.com slash go. plenairconvention.com slash go. Also, my Adirondack painting adventure is starting to fill up. Uh, we're already ahead of last year. Uh, this is the ninth year I've done it. And it's the actual the 10th Publishers Invitational because the first one I did not do in the Adirondacks. And this year my contract expires at the college. We stay at Paul Smith College and we have these beautiful dorms. And anyway, contract's up. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do it again, if I'm gonna move it or, or if I'll return or if they'll even do a contract with us or if they raise the prices so much I can't afford to do a contract, just don't know. But anyway, if you've been thinking about coming to the Adirondacks, this is the only year I can guarantee we're gonna be there. Uh, I'm not saying we won't. I'm just saying we might not. And so uh, sign up. It's called Publishers Invitational, but there's no invitation required. It's going to be a week of just painting incredible scenery, mountains and waterfalls, and just really beautiful. Now, I can't say who because in the Adirondacks, we're all equals. You know, if somebody famous comes, uh, they're just one of the painters, and there's a very famous painter joining us this year. Uh, but this person's going to be just one of the gangs. So anyway, you can learn more at publishersinvitational.com. Not about that, because I'm not talking about that anymore. Coming up after the interview, I'll be answering art marketing questions in the Marketing Minute. But first, our interview with Richard Oversmith. Well, I'm proud today to have Richard Oversmith on the Plein Air Podcast. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you. I'm honored to uh, be on the podcast. No, the Thank honor you. is ours. We're, we're honored to have you. 
So let me let me just start out here uh, because there are so many people who are listening to the Plain Air podcast, and a lot of them are new to all of this. They don't necessarily know the artists, and so why don't you start out by telling everybody a, a little bit about what it is you do? How would you differentiate yourself as an artist? Okay. Uh, well, I would consider myself, I guess an impressionist, um, like the French impressionist, the American impressionist, um, Russian impressionist are some of my biggest influences. Um, and so when I look at my work, I tend to, to have that same feeling that the impressionist wanted to get in their work, um, a feeling of, um, or an impression of a, of, of a subject basically with light and color and shape and things like that. And that's uh, basically how I would how I, how I would explain my work. Um, it's uh, it's been a long journey, um, and I didn't start out so much wanting to be an impressionist, but it's kind of just ended up that way. So, well, let's talk about that journey. Uh, perhaps okay. we can kind of start. We'll go back to when you were a wee little lad. <laughs> Yes, right. back in so, 1971, yes. <laughs> so give, give me a, a feel for first impressions of art, first first recognizable moments when you might think that something uh, caught your eye or influenced you in terms of art. Oh, wow, yeah, that's a good one. Um, good question. Um, you know, I, I, I was actually raised in High Point, North Carolina, so not the cultural... Um, hub of the world for sure. Um, so I, um, uh, my experiences were limited. Um, you know, museum visits were very limited as a child, and my both my parents were very encouraging, actually, of anything I did um, related to drawing and things like that, um, which was a blessing to me for sure. Um, but um, the um, so my, my, my experiences growing up, I said, like I said, we're limited, um, but they, um, they definitely expanded more as I, as I grew and, and, and became a, a more experienced artist and things like that. So um, when you, you were the typical kid with crayons and drawing or oh, what, definitely. was there yeah, a mostly, particular yeah. person who kind of influenced you or got you started on this path or did you always kind of know you wanted to be an artist? Yeah. Well, it's funny. Um, I, I drew mostly with, um, graphite and on pencil when I was a kid and it was, it was mostly very rendered, um, work, um, very tight, um, drawings and basically anything I could get my hands on, um, images out of a magazine, uh, from life sometimes. Uh, my dad was a big influence on me. He actually was a commercial photographer for 30 some years and he had his own studio in Greensboro, North Carolina. So he, um, I would go to his studio and I would be inspired by photo books and things like that that he had and it would help him out and as much as I could as a kid. And so I had that art experience growing up. I just didn't have too much of a cultural experience, I guess until a little later. So you, uh, you transformed then from being a uh, child who was interested in art. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what took it to the next level? Did you, did you go through a typical high school, college, and then pursue it? Or yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, all through elementary and high school, I studied uh, every, every class, every semester I had art um, through those things. And then, one um, one of the experiences I had was when I was in a junior in um, high school. Um, I took a summer class at the North Carolina School of the Arts, which is a um, high school and a four-year college, um, all art-related, uh, dance, visual arts, um, music, all that stuff. So I went there for the summer, and I took a class, and I really enjoyed it. I thought I would um, apply to the high school to get into the high school for my senior year and one of my so I, I submitted a portfolio and one of my teachers as one of my teachers uh, for the summer program he he got back to me with with a kind of a crude um cr critique of my work and it was and it was very eye-opening actually he said something crude to you what what 
did he say and how crude was it? Okay, so he he said my work was tight ass and constipated, and he was right. It was true. He he basically woke me up to the fact that my work had no um, sort of feeling to it. It it had a I had a technical skill. I had you know I could draw anything, but I just did not get any feeling in my work. And he w- with that statement he opened my eyes to, yeah, I, I need to get some feeling. I need to get something in my work that gives somebody something to, to grasp onto. The so viewer, did that, did that so. Uh, challenge you? Did it make you want to quit? What was the, the outcome of that? Yeah, so it did. It did challenge me. Um, it, it hurt me, and, and, but I, I got stronger from it, I think. You know, I think it took me some years to figure out that that made me a stronger person. But um, the um, I was gonna quit uh, art altogether, and that's just something that you know from a early uh, from early time in my life I wanted to be an artist, and so I was uh, at at some at one point I was like you know I'm gonna be a veterinary doctor instead, and, and it's a good thing because I got a terrible grade in biology, so it, I went back to art. Um, it didn't take very long, and I just kept kept doing it, and um, you know of course still doing it today. So. So did you end up in that high school? I did not. Um, no. You know, his critique um, was he was the sort of final say in, in the whole thing. And he, and I'm sure there was a panel, but um, yeah, I just didn't, didn't end up in the school. Um, and he, or I, basically after that, um, just kept on go- going through high school art and senior year. Um, I had a great art teacher. Um, she was a big influence on me. Of course, my parents were a big influence on me. And then I went to college, um, which was a four-year program at Kendall College of Art and Design in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And from, let's see, um, while I was there, um, I, well, I was from High Point, North Carolina. So my, um, my goal was to go up there and study furniture design. Um, and basically, uh, after, after about two months, um, in the foundation and talking to other people and in the furniture design program, I decided to go into illustration instead because it was a lot more about freehand drawing and, and, and drawing from life and things like that. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, and my, probably my goal was to be a, you know, like a lot of people was to be a graphic designer when I got out or an illustrator. Um, and being in the illustrative illustration department, that was kind of the goal. But at the same time, illustration was sort of a dying thing. It was ninety one well, when, when I was in college. The computer changed everything. Didn't computer, it? it did. It did, and I just didn't want to uh, deal with that. Um, I was okay on the computer, but I wanted to get my hands dirty and get into the paint, and, and not, I mean, not literally, but like you know, just actually enjoy the process of the whole thing and, and not on the computer so much. So. so you get out of college. Now what? Mm-hmm. Well, actually before, let me, before I let's backtrack a little bit, my last, um, uh, my last year I studied at the Royal college of art in London, England. And that's where I did my first plein air painting, um, which was an exciting thing for me. Um, I studied illustration for a summer there in, in London for six weeks, and um, they had us go outside and paint. And I had never done that before. I'd never, um, it never even occurred to me to do that, I guess, as a kid. And, and through college, they never, they never did that. I mean, I had a great foundation in Kindle, but they didn't really teach me anything about painting, per se. So what, so, what happened when you uh, went outdoors to paint? Uh, what what changed? It was, it was well, gosh, it was like... It, it was just like I was hooked. I was, you know, immediately hooked on it. Uh, we went to places like Hyde Park, um, Kew Gardens, um, just the streets of London. Um, you know, people hardly ever, I mean, well, some people paint cars, you know, in modern cars and things like that on the street. But, you know, everything was so new to me. It was such a new cultural experience for me, too, you know, just being away from America for the first time and being in this place that's totally new and you just realize how what a large world it is really yeah what age you know, were you how, at, how at that small time you're... 
this was tw- uh, I was twenty three. Oh, so, okay. you know, this is the end of, or the end of my my college career. So, so um, you're in London. Yeah. So I, now you're you're plein air painting. London. What happens next? Right. Uh, after that, let's see. Um, I mean, of course, there's. Um, I get back after London, and um, I have a I have a friend that was just starting to sort of study with Richard Schmidt. And so um, he gave me a couple pointers. And I also read Richard Schmidt's book a couple times. A la Prima. And that's kind of where it all started. Uh-huh. Yeah, A la Prima, the, the original book. Um, and I, I, at that point, that was enough for me to just keep going. Um, I, um, from there... Uh, it was it was just reading the book a couple times, um, painting as much as I could, uh, a brief um, graphic design job, but then didn't knew that wasn't for me. So I was basically working at a frame shop part time for a long time, and also raising my two girls uh, when they were young, really young. Um, so I basically could only paint like during the day. Um, I mean, actually at night with, with like uh, artificial light. So I do a lot of still lifes and things like that. So I always wanted to paint from life and then getting out as much as possible, which was hard. But, um, so basically I just kept, kept painting and, 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 and I only had one workshop my whole life, um, which is kind of odd, but it was with, uh, T. Allen Lawson and also the big influential the time in my life was just seeing somebody else paint. Really. I didn't really have that experience much before. Um, of course the friend that studied with Richard Schmidt, I'd watch him paint a couple of times, but, but not, but haven't, hadn't seen too many people at this point paint, um, which I think is a, is the way I would, I learn. Um, and I, and I'm assuming a lot of artists learn is by watching other people paint. Yeah. So if, if you had to, um, do it all over again, knowing what you know now. You've been painting for a number of years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, sure. What would you do differently? Wow. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's what I'm known for. I'm not sure I would do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, you are. I'm not sure I would do anything differently. You know, I, I like the fact that I learned slow. I'm a slow learner. I um, I take it at my own pace. Um and I like the fact that I've taught myself how to paint fast and accurately um, using, you know, good light and color and things like that. Um, why is that important? And, you know, my goal is to get, why is it important to me? Um, because mm-hmm. I want my work to have a, a life to it, you know, and, and it, almost an, not an expression. I guess it is kind of an expression. Uh, a light, uh, just a, a nice energy to it, and that's kind of what I've taught myself to do over the years. I think. So is that um, about speed, though? Because if, you, you know, you talk about Richard, and that's true. and yeah. I've, I've painted with Richard, and you know, when you look at his paintings, they look like they were executed very fast. But the opposite is true. Right. Richard is very deliberate, yeah. very slow. He spends right. a lot of time mixing those brush, mi- mixing those colors, and then he'll lay that brush stroke on very carefully, one time only. Then he never goes yeah. back and corrects it. Right. So it has, and, right. and I hear that Sargent was the same way. That Sargent was slow and deliberate, but it looked right. like it was fast. Yes, yeah, that's true. I mean, and you can you have people like that that are really good at it, and I and I I'm. I, quite that genius about it (laughs) (laughs) i um i let's see yeah i mean you can i think you can do the same thing either painting fast or slow and it the i guess the main goal really for a lot of people is to for the viewer to look at your work and really connect to it somehow and that's what my what I try to do is is put an energy an energetic feel to a, the painting, and that's why I think people connect to my work. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do. So you went through this process of you you got out of school, you had learned uh, illustration, you'd learned plein air painting, you came home, you're working in a frame shop, 
Uh, when did you make the transition to actually making your living as an artist, and how did that happen? Yeah, yeah, like another good question. Um, yes, we. Um, so, the family and I, um, in 2007, no, it was 2006 actually. We moved to France. Um, so it was my wife and my five-year-old girl and my two-year-old girl all moved to France um, for seven months. Um, we lived in Brittany. We lived in a town near the coast, um, and we didn't have a car the whole time. Uh, we rented an apartment and rented out our house here in, in North Carolina, um, and we made it work so we could live over there for seven months, and we did, and I painted every day. So that was my first time ever painting every day in my life. Before that, it was very sporadic because of the part-time job and the family and all this stuff, so... So how did how did you talk the misses into that? Because okay, you, you got <laughs> oh, two kids, you got no income, yeah, and yeah. you say, "Oh, honey, by the way, right. we're moving to France, and I'm going to paint every day." <laughs> it really didn't take a lot of convincing, really. She got a uh, very supportive. Um, she, yeah, I do, and she also um, studied French in school. So I mean, her major was French, um, so that helped out a lot. I don't speak French myself, but <laughs> and I would love to. It's just my brain isn't isn't sort of wired for that kind of thing. Um, but so yeah, so she was very supportive basically, and and our daughter went to kindergarten over there for half a year, and so it was it was challenging, but um, it was also um, culturally very eye opening, and and just kind of um, and, and just the first like we said the first time where I'd been painting every day, and, and that's I wanna, where I, I want to talk about that, I'm Richard. Because I think that's yeah. a, a really important uh, thing to, to discuss. Something happens mm -hmm. to a painter when they get to that point when they can paint every day. Something happens to their work. I agree, yeah. Talk to me about that. Yes. Well, I think it's uninterrupted sort of um, concentration on your, your skills and your goals. You can't usually get in a part-time situation so i think basically it, and it's also about like that that old expression you know ten thousand hours and you're a master at something i don't consider myself a master at anything but to, at, i've probably done ten thousand hours of painting i've you know I've, I've i've painted a lot in my life i've painted a lot of bad paintings which are also very good um lessons um i think better so than creating a, a you know a good painting is creating a bad painting it, it teaches you don't do that again or or whatever it teaches you at the time depending on what it is well i've watched so many artists who have transitioned from a job to becoming a full-time painter and watch mm -hmm. their progress um one particular artist comes to mind uh, who i won't mention but watching mm -hmm. him go from a full-time job doing something else and having been a part-time painter and going to a full-time mm -hmm. painter watching the transition over two years was staggeringly amazing you know to see how it somebody is, yeah. who was uh, uh, relatively accomplished but how much better they got by just painting every day for two years and you know eight hours a day yeah makes a big difference that's true it does it makes a big difference and i've been doing it since well see 2000 so it's um 13 no 20, yeah 13 years now almost yeah. now you so travel yeah, i mean the you more travel you quite a bit um from what i understand yeah. it travel traveling and traveling abroad is kind of part of your dna as an artist is it not it is yeah it is um i love i love traveling it's like my other passion i mean well i have other passions but one of my big big passions is is traveling, and and we love to go to France and Europe and and some other places. Um, and I and I, I always try to bring my paints wherever I go. Now, you know, one thing we've never talked about ever on the Plein Air podcast, if I can, I, I don't think we've ever talked about it, and it's something mm -hmm. we should talk about. This is a good opportunity. Talk to mm -hmm. the people out there about traveling with paints. What's the trick yeah. to it? Uh, how do you do it? <laughs> well, I've learned a lot um, over the years. Like I said, my first experience really was uh, that seven months living abroad 
Um, and that's when I had a um, half French easel uh, palette and all my paint and all my stuff. And we didn't have a car, so I had it on my back in a backpack that I made. And I tell you, my back was was messed up for years <laughs> after that trip. But um, so I've learned, you know, obviously that you have to have the right equipment and the right um, uh, stuff to travel. I mean, um, you know, I'm, now I'm using much lighter easels, um, much um, smaller tubes of paint, things like that. So you can um, so you can travel lightly. Um, you know, of course, nowadays we have we usually have a car when we're in Europe, and I drive and whatever. So it's a little bit easier getting around. Um, but um, but you know, painting it's always it's always going to pare down, and that's something you just learn basically with um, with experience. Um, of now painting. you said something about smaller tubes of paint. Yeah. Um, of course, the problem with that is, of course, you, you run out. Uh, yeah, you just you, bring a bunch of them. Yeah, so yeah. so um, when, when you say smaller, are you talking about normal tubes that you were using the Giant and then you went to normal tubes, or are you going down yeah, to mini, miniature I tubes? Normally, right. I usually use a 150-milliliter tube, um, but, the, I'm, but when I go over abroad, sometimes I use the 37 because you can actually travel through – um, you know, security with those um, because they're sm- they're under three ounces. Um, you take so your you paints. Actually... You take your paints on the airplane. Yes, correct. Well, I, I mean, yeah. you you carry them on board, or do you check them? Yes, yeah, so it depends. Really, um, it depends where I'm going, how long, and um, how much paint I'm bringing. Um, if I can bring a bunch of little tubes of paint, I can bring them on through the security line. Um, I've only had one problem. Uh, with that, and that was in Costa Rica of all places. They, um, I, I had a, a, a like a, a little box full of paint, um, and they wouldn't let me take it through, so I had to actually ship it back um, because my other luggage was already checked and all this stuff. So I had to actually ship it back to home. Have so you ever only, arrived ever in a location trouble. and had uh, anything missing? Uh, or you're you're carrying everything on board. You carry your easel on board. Everything. I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah everything's on board. Um, usually, my you know, I have a backpack with all my stuff in it, um, and that's enough for me to you know to paint with. Um, turpentine, obviously, I I never never use that. I'll I'll buy it when I get there. But um, so that becomes a problem, n- though. And you know, you're going to Costa Rica. How do you find turpentine? Yeah, that is a problem. Um, I. What did I do down there? I um, I think I probably went to the hardware store and got some really bad, you know, um, turpentine stuff. You know, the stuff that you get from the the hardware store because it was hard. Yeah, it was hard finding a um, it was hard finding a, a, a art supply store down there. And my actually, I mean, that was that was more of a sort of a um, 20th wedding anniversary thing with my wife, but I also had a commission I was working on of a, of a, uh, the guy's view from his condo down in Costa Rica. So I wasn't painting a lot, but, but I did have to have that stuff to, to make it work. So yeah. that's something you have to think about. Yeah. So, um, talk to me about your process and your technique. Sure. Uh, okay. I, I think it would be helpful for everybody to understand how you paint. Yeah, so um, I, I, obvi- I mean, as, as a lot of artists do, I, I paint thin to thick. Um, this is the best way to do it without, so it doesn't crack and things like that. So basically, let's, in the beginning... Let's stop you there. Sure, sure. Uh, because yeah. uh, I, I think that one, one of the things that happens on the podcast is those of us who are very tight and intimate with these things understand them. But somebody who's yep. brand new sure. does not understand the concept of of uh, thin to thick or okay. you know lean over uh, fat over lean. So right, would would right. you talk about that and why that's important? Okay, so yeah, I think um, why it's important is because um, if you try to put thin paint over thick paint, um, it it doesn't work too well. Like you, you're trying to put uh, you really kind of have to have a consistency, um, 
you, that you're putting paint into to be somewhat thicker than what you've already got on there. Um, and, and I don't do a lot of blending, um, in my work. It's basically just kind of putting paint on top of other paint. So when I start a painting, my, my turpentine is, or my, my paint is, is, is very water, not watered down, but, um, diluted with turpentine in the beginning, almost to the point where it's kind of almost runny. So I can get the sort of big shapes in quickly um, with that. So I'm using like a, a sepia tone or sometimes uh, just random sort of colors to get sort of the darker parts of the painting. So in, would you in, consider in the way that an underpainting or is that just a guide? Yeah, I think so. It's a, it, well, it's not an underpainting so much as that there's no detail whatsoever. It's, it, it could be more of a guide. Yeah, I think you're right on that, that I'm basically just want the value structure there quickly so I can, so I can start putting paint on top of that. Um, or, you know, the, the, the sort of local color and, and light of the, of the piece. I want, I want to put that on top of that. So I don't ever do any kind of um, preliminary drawing on my work. I used to a while ago. And then I, at, at one point, at some point, I'm just like, you know, all this is getting um, covered up. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of no point because you get to a point where you're, you get so used to putting paint down or in, and you have a sketch, you know, that you're working from anyway, you have this, the idea. And that's the, I think the most important part is the idea of, of what this painting is going to look like before you even start and getting that going by just putting loose sort of marks where major shapes are and, and things like that. So basically that's how I sort of start a painting. Okay. Tell me about the rest of your process. Yeah. So the rest of the process is um, then you start at once that sort of initial sort of template is there. You, you start, uh, or I start painting rather quickly putting um, color on and Basically, I start usually start with a sort of darker uh, values. Um, so the the dark darks, the darkest darks, uh, that kind of thing. Maybe not the darkest dark, but the, the, the sort of maybe the next thing down. So I have an idea where that sort of jump off from and the lights and things like that. So I I put the darks down and with the with the color that I think I see basically. But I might, but at some at some times I might look at that color that I'm, you know, if I'm painting outside, I might look at that color or those trees or whatever I'm painting, and I and I see the local color, but I'm, it's affected by light, of course, and it's affected by I might want to saturate it a little more just just by um, just by you know bringing up the the, the chroma a little bit um in 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 certain areas and not so much in other areas and that's what i think makes an interesting painting mm -hmm. or at least in in my realm of painting are you in lay it down and never touch the brush stroke again or do you you mentioned earlier you don't do a lot of blending no i don't um i i do lay it down um and don't and then i sometimes i'll i'll go back and go over it again but i don't blend like i said i don't blend i think that's what causes um muddy color a lot is where you're blending into what you've already got so you're actually just you know keep you know blending into that other color and basically it's combining the colors together and making a color that is just not really that desirable usually sometimes it is um but i think what makes my work kind of interesting a lot of the time is the shadow and the light usually have uh, a vibration of um warm and cool colors you know if it's a sunny day i like to have um a sh the shadows cool but also have warms in there because there's going to be reflected light into that and so it gives a sort of a vibration inside that shadow or inside a, a, a big lit up area um so it doesn't have a con just one consistent warm quality or cool quality it has a sort of a an energy to it, and that's kind of where I want my work to, to be. So now, what about terminator lines? You know, there's some some artists who who believe that 
um, whether you see it in nature or not, that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of chroma at the point at which shadow meets light. Uh, so oftentimes mm -hmm. you'll see someone put a, what, what some call a bed bug line or a terminator line, which is uh -huh. a high chroma line right there between the cool and the warm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't really pay too much attention to that. You know, if it's there, I'll paint it in if I see it, which is, it's, which is another thing, you know, observing things. Um, I've become a lot better at observing things when I'm outside over the years, over these last, uh, you know, 12 years that I've been painting full time. Um, before I could not see, you know, um, value that well i couldn't see temperature that well it's one of those things where you have to train yourself to do it um and the more you do it the, and the more you the, the, you the information you, re, you get from other people and, and from doing it that's when you can actually uh, start to see it which is kind of a really uh, an interesting thing so do you teach um i do i teach um but not very much um it's not my main gig it's um you know, my main gig is, is just painting. You know, that's what I want to do. And, and who doesn't, right? Who doesn't want to just paint? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, but the, so reason, I, the reason I ask that is because you, you talked yeah. about things that you had trouble with in the beginning, things like values yeah. and, and uh, color harmony. Can you touch on the right. best way to learn those things, the best way to train yeah. yourself to understand them? Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, I think... Um, I think you have to, um, I think it's, I think a lot of it has to do with observation. You know, I think there's no other way to do it. I mean, maybe there are, I, when I teach a workshop, I'm very hands-on and very out in the field and, um, I don't plan a lot of things. It's more off the cuff kind of thing for me. Um, I don't do well with a script, so I, I tend to kind of, um, paint or to teach in a sort of a style that I guess I would want to be in, be involved in if I was t t taking a workshop, I guess. And so, um, I, I don't do a lot of, um, I guess, uh, activities and things like that where people are learning how to do, you know, values and, and, and looking at color and stuff like that. I like to take it out into the field show them how I work. Um, I think that's, I mean, I don't know. Not everybody learns that way from, from, um, uh, seeing somebody else do something. But, um, for me, that's, that's the key is to actually see something actually happening, you know? Um, and so I tend to gravitate towards stuff like that, seeing it and then explaining it, as I go, which is kind of a hard thing to do. And a lot of, I'm, there's a lot, I'm sure there's a lot of great painters out there that can do it really well. Um, but actually using two sides of your brain, I guess, at the same time in, um, you know, uh, painting and then explaining it at the same time. Um, I usually get quieter as, as the painting progresses towards the end. And then at the end, I, I sort of go over what I've done. And so that's kind of how I try to teach people if I, when I do workshops, um, so that it's not, um, it's not a, a lot about doing activities and, and, and that kind of thing. Okay. So and, and talk to me more about, uh, technique. Let's continue that discussion. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and then, so once I've got, I was talking about the, uh, I started laying in color and things like that. Um, I keep, I just keep going and I work around the whole canvas, um, as I go. Oh, this might be kind of interesting to people. I probably work in a, in a different way than a lot of people do is the, in that I mix all my colors on my palette with a brush, um, and then put them on the canvas rather than some people use palette knife, um, and they make pools of color and things like that. The colors that they see like big, you know, big pools of it so they can sort of make big shapes and things like that. But I tend to um, uh, make pools of color as I need it. And then I'll kind of run out and then I'll have to like actually add more color into it and things like that. So I think what happens in my work is that's how I create the harmony in my work. 
is the fact that I'm constantly kind of working over the whole canvas and that um, um, I'm actually blending color into pools of color. You know, like I might use like white and yellow for a sky or something like that. And that same same pool of color, I could add other colors into it and get sort of a tree line color or something like that. So it's basically like I'm using pools of color that I've used in other areas and I'm adding paint to it. So it becomes um, harmonious, at least uh, most of the time. <laughs> Excellent. So, well, uh, let's talk about yeah. uh, plein air versus studio painting. You do both. Tell me, uh, tell yeah. me your thinking yeah. on this. You know, there's a, a lot of people who believe plein air is not an e a means to an end. There are others who believe that it it it, it is a finished painting. Some think it yeah, should right. be used only for studio painting. What I, yeah. I noticed on your website, you you show both. Tell me about that. Yes, right. Well, I think I think it can be you know in and itself. It's it's I've created a lot of paintings in plein air that that have sold or they are very appealing to me um, as a painter. Um, I think of like Soroya, you know, uh, or Sorolla um, painting those big paintings on the beach, unless those were doctor photographs or just like marketing tools he did. He did some really amazing pieces outside. Um, and that is as much plain air as anything else, you know, doing those big pieces. And I, and I, I have done some pretty large pieces outside and I consider them, finished paintings um but i would say like 80 percent of what i do now is probably studio stuff um because i've done plein air so long um i have this um tendency to to know what light is um working from a photograph which is it's, it doesn't really always um it kind of lies to you a little bit photographs they tend to be darker and sort of um, those shadows are pretty dead usually and things like that. But, um, I tend to, um, I, I can use them, I guess, to, as a jumping off point to make something look plain air. That's, that's my goal really is to make something look like it was done in plain air, but it's done in the studio. So, that, so that's, how do, that's, that's where I'm at that's right hard now. to do, um, I, I've just it been, is. Yeah. been experiencing this as a, trying to take a, a plein air study and do a, a much larger studio piece, and I, it lacks the energy, it lacks the, the vibrancy. I'm trying to get it just yep. the same, but is there a trick to translating your plein air work in the studio mm -hmm. when you're not under all that pressure? Yeah. Gosh, I think it's it's much easier in the studio, but uh, you know you also have to have that experience outside as much as possible. Um, I think for me, um, uh, the you know I, um, I don't know. I just have having that experience in plain air has really got me to the point where um, I can do most anything that I could do outside inside. Um, I don't know if there's a trick to it. Um, I wish there was a trick to it. Um, I think working um, in the same way you do outside, maybe given this, you're the same amount of time inside as outside, and that, that kind of thing, where you're not changing it up too much, um, would probably help. Uh, I, 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 I tend to, like I said, I tend to paint pretty fast. Um, and I do the same inside and outside. So that I think keeps the energy and the sort of freshness of a piece going just by limiting sort of a, a time frame. Mm -hmm. I don't think that works for everybody, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. it doesn't work for everybody. Um, but it, it's, it t tends to work pretty well for me. So. so let's talk a little bit more about being outdoors. Um, being out sure. in nature and the observation in nature. Talk to me about um, being out there and interpreting and painting. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there, I think there's always, I mean, observation is a funny thing because, like, you know, I always thought when I saw these paintings by Monet and, and people that I admire still, um, I, I love his work, and it, you know, I, I, I always think, I always thought that they, you know, because these paint, these things were painted so well that people, 
people are out there uh, finding these perfect spots to paint, you know, and, and, um, and there are sort of sure beautiful spots that you don't really have to change almost anything about them to make a painting. Um, but that's not really the case a lot of the time. So observation for me is going out and, and painting from life and then changing uh, what I see in nature um, to make it fit the canvas that I'm working on. So um, to make it work um, shape wise and things like that. And I think in general for me, and I guess in I mean, almost all art is just basically about shapes and color, you know, and sometimes it's not even about color. It's about shapes, you know, really it's about big shapes and little shapes. Um, and so when you go outside observing nature and, and whatever you're painting, um, you're looking for something that, that you can create into, um, a, an aesthetic, you know, painting based on the shapes that you have in front of you. Uh, you might have to move some things around to make that work. Um, but I think in general, um, that's what I do when I go out is, is look for the, the big shapes, observe, um, you know, observing color is, is another thing where you're, you're looking at local color or the way light hits a color. I tend, it's funny. I tend to kind of paint in the middle of the afternoon more than other artists I know. When you uh, uh, talk, talk to of, me about local color, because there's another term that a lot of people sure. aren't aware of. Yeah. So local color is basically just the color that an object is. So I get right. I mean, I, 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 if I'm not, if I'm incorrect in that, tell me, but it's basically like, if you're looking at like a mountain in the distance, it's got this color to it. Well, it's, that's affected by atmosphere, but if you're looking at like a tree or something close or, or, like a, a a hill or something like that, it has a color to it. But then light that hits that, depending on how low the light is or what kind of light it is, that affects everything. So all that has to be taken into consideration when you're when you're painting outside. And I think um, uh, it's 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 important to really be observant as possible. I mean, I, like like I said, as a, as from a young kid. I was always very observant, always out looking inquisitive about things and, and that kind of thing. So that helps me out. But and I'm sure that that can be a teach or a taught thing is where you're actually um, can, can see to observing. And I know it can be because, like I said, I could not see value that well when I started or um, or, or even color that well. It just it, I think the more you do it the more you see it and the more you can sort of saturate color more and, and make right. it sort of more interesting. Yeah. That's kind of what I do now. So three best for, for, for the people who are listening to this, who are kind of starting out three best tips, three things that they really oh, wow. need to focus on. Okay. Uh, value I think is very important. Um, Get your values down quickly. Um, your big shapes, like three to five big shapes, plenty, I think. And then um, get those get those down in value, and then start working with with color as uh, soon as you can. Um, because if you're outside, you have a limited time to to work, and you need to kind of get it done quickly, but in a, in a uh, not in a sloppy way, I guess. Um, that would be one of them. Uh, my, you know, the, the value thing, um, uh, go out and observe, uh, you know, as much as possible. Um, maybe with not even painting, but just looking at what happens to something when the light gets lower or, or, you know, like if you're looking at a mountain or whatever, you know, look at it in the middle of the day, look at it, you know, um, uh, in later day, see what light does to, to uh, an object it, it totally changes the color it totally changes everything about it be you you know is and that's that's a hard thing with with as many workshops as are going on right now and, and things like that i think anytime you can 
decide early on who you are in painting um, and, and learn from your mistakes and things like that. Um, I think that, at least for me, was a great way to go. Um, I wouldn't change that for the world, um, being able to learn uh, from my mistakes and, and, and learn on my own t to some degree. Um, I, of course, I had plenty of teachers out there that taught me things, but um, as far as painting goes, a lot of it, it was, was sort of self, self-learned. So. Right. Just do a lot of painting so you can learn from it. Exactly. I mean, I, I've done hundreds and hundreds of paintings, so uh, maybe thousands um, of paintings. And, and so, um, and a lot of them, I, I wouldn't even want to look at anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. and, well, there is so, that. You know, to get into the burn pile and things. <laughs> well, what's nice about them is so, you can, yeah, you can look back and, and, and uh, see the progress that you've made. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a thing on my website that, that my archive and I, I keep meaning to take it off because like I cringe every time I see it. There's some older paintings on there that are um, in my archive that I can really see. I mean, it's kind of nice because I can really see how where I've come from, you know, and how quickly it's happened, really too. Yeah. Um, so to you know, I'm not at all up to a finish line. You never are because you're never 100 percent satisfied with anything as an artist. Or if you are, then maybe you're in the wrong business. Um, so, you know, I think um, I think it's important to, uh, to just get out and paint as much as possible, really. That's, that's, well, any uh, final thoughts goal. for our, our listeners today? Ooh, final thoughts. Well, um, I, I just say learn all you can, uh, you know, uh, from anybody. If, if, you, uh, if you've got friends or, or if you take a workshop, learn and actually if you do take a workshop from people um you know listen to what they say and, and do what they say i have people in my workshops that come into my workshops and they they don't uh really change at all the way they work from when they were working at home so it's it's i think it's you have to be open to doing something different and learning and, and actually failing too at a workshop too that's that's an important part so that's my final thought i guess well richard this has been fabulous thank you for taking the time to be on the plein air podcast today thank you so much i really enjoyed it i appreciate it thanks eric well again my thanks to richard oversmith and thank you for being on the plein air podcast uh should we do some marketing ideas this is the marketing minute with eric rhodes author of the number one amazon bestseller make more money selling your art proven techniques to turn your passion into profit well, here's a question from Joan Barnum. Now, I normally don't use last names, and I don't know where Joan is from, but uh, uh, in this case, it's relevant because she says, thanks so much for your podcast and for the Marketing Minute. I tune in every week, and I've learned so much uh, value from both. I've been learning what I can about selling my art, and I've been trying to establish some kind of online presence. But I discovered recently, however, that there is a well-known watercolor artist out there whose name is very similar to mine. She's Joanna Barnum, and I'm Joan Barnum. I wonder if it will make it difficult for people to find me online and if I should consider changing the name under which I do business, reverting to my maiden name, for instance. I'm just in the beginning stages of the process, and so I'm going to make this sort of move. Now would be the time. Well, I couldn't agree more. It's a great question. It happens more than you think. I can think of several. Uh, what comes to mind is Scott Pryor, and then there's Scott W. Pryor, both artists. There's Charles White, and there's Charles H. White, both artists. And, heck, there's even another Eric Rhodes, who was, well, an adult film star. Uh, that wasn't me, thankfully. Yikes. Anyway, he's dead. Um, I'm not. Uh, I might be after I mention that. Anyway, if, if you're already established with the name and then you discover somebody else has got the name, well, then you got a little bit of a problem. And you, if you're starting out, though, this is a good time to avoid confusion and brand yourself under a name where there'll be no confusion. Now, I grew up in radio, and we used to do stage names all the time, and you might want to invent a name that sends a signal of confidence to your buyer. Some people pick names that are about their brand. You know, like if you were a spy, you could be Roger Danger or, you know, remember Johnny Quest. He was an adventurer on, uh, on the cartoons. 
Richie Rich. <laughs> but seriously, I, I'd probably go uh, go out there and come up with a name that really works for you. Now, I wouldn't call yourself Monet, though there are people out there who've done it. There's an actress whose name is Monet. I wonder if it's real. I doubt it. But anyway, come up with something distinctive. Uh, stage names are pretty common, and there are a lot of artists, actually, who use stage names. And, and if your maiden name works, uh, it's great. But if it's hard to say or it's hard to spell or hard to read, like if your maiden name is Rabenowitz, you might want to do something easier. Like I have this friend who's uh, a radio person, and her name was Rabenowitz. And, you know, how do you spell it? So she changed it to Robbins, and you might do something like that. Or you could just be distinctive by saying, uh, you know, your middle initial. The other thing you've got to your advantage is that you want a name that's memorable, and you have a name that's memorable, right? Who, uh, who is memorable? P.T. Barnum is memorable. Why not be uh, L. Barnum or P.T. Barnum or some variation on that? Or there may be... You play off of that, you know, Linda Barnum, like, you know, like P.T. Barnum, the greatest show on earth. You know, you can have some fun with that. So give it some thought. Anyway, it's a good time. Remember, you are a brand. We invent names for brands, and why not do it for artist brands? Now, I think authentic and real is best, but in a case like yours where there's going to be confusion and the names are close, you might want to consider distinguishing yourself with a different first name at least, and uh, don't forget, there is some gold in that name Barnum because you want something that people remember because everyday names like Jones and Smith and so on are not very memorable. But if you say, uh, you know, introduce yourself or your website says, hey, you know, it's Linda Barnum, like P.T. Barnum, and then they're trying to remember who you are, they're going to remember that. Here's the next question from Adam in Los Angeles. Adam says, I've noticed everybody's moved over to Instagram from Facebook. How can I get a lot of followers so I can sell more art? And Adam, well, um, you're asking the wrong question. Not to embarrass you, but the question should be, how can I sell more art? Instagram is a tactic, just like a magazine ad or an email is a tactic. You want to start with a strategy. How are you going to differentiate? Who is going to be your audience? What is the avatar of your audience? The avatar is like, who's the average person who buys your art and what do they like? Explain and understand that avatar. You know, like we know the avatar of the people who come to the Plan Air Convention and there's a lot of the similar type of people. So we tend to talk to them. So think about that because you want to think about who you're trying to sell art to. Now, most people on Instagram and Facebook are misusing it and they're really talking about themselves a lot, and they're not really talking about the business aspects. And so you want to think about that. Now, I'm going to do something very special at the Plein Air Convention this year. I'm going to do a morning on Instagram in my art marketing boot camp, and that'll be worth the price of admission alone, believe me. So I went to the world's top experts. I got their tips. I'm going to explain them, plus I'm going to share some of my own. And there's not enough time here because I'm going to spend about an hour just on that. And probably an hour isn't enough. But bottom line with Instagram is it's about engaging people. It's about commenting often, smart commenting. And uh, those kinds of things, engagement and commenting, will help people follow you. Also liking other people. But there's a whole lot more to it, a lot of strategy behind it. So uh, I didn't mean to be snide by saying it's a wrong question, but you want to be thinking about multiple pillars. You don't want all of your business relying on one thing. Like Facebook has lost 60 million people recently. So what if your business was based on Facebook? You know, would it affect you? Uh, it might. So if your business is affected by Instagram at one time, and then you have to reinvent yourself another time, you should be doing multiple pillars anyway. You should be having a lot of different variations on the way that you, you market yourself. Anyway, hope that's helpful. Anyway, that's the Marketing Minute. Well, I will see you at the Plein Air Convention in San Francisco. If you're going to do it, if you've been on the fence, just do it. It will be worth it, believe me. Uh, we've got a 100% money back guarantee. If you go, if by the end of the first day, you're like, I hate this, we'll give you your money back because we want you to be happy. And just go. You're going to have so much fun. Um, also, 
Come and paint with me in the Adirondacks. It's going to be fun. Upstate New York this June. Uh, we are pacing ahead of last year, which means we're going to run out of seats early this year. Um, and we're going to have, you know, we always do this closing party. We're going to have a closing party at a brand new place this year. And it's going to be on an island. But I can't say any more than that. But it's going to be pretty intriguing. And remember, I can't guarantee Adirondacks continue after this year because I don't have a contract yet. I might, but not right now. Anyway, it's going to be fun. You can find more about that at publishersinvitational.com. Also, if you've not seen my Sunday morning blog called Sunday Coffee, it's got a lot of readers now, so I'm pretty thankful for that. I do it on Sunday mornings. Get up, go out to the back porch, and just start writing, and who knows what's going to come out of this crazy mouth. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's called Sunday Coffee, but you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. It's always fun doing this. It's always fun spending time with you. Let's do it again sometime, like maybe next week. I will see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and the founder of Plen Air Magazine, number one art magazine on the newsstands nationally at Barnes & Noble. That's pretty cool. Thank you so much for that. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at pleinairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening. <laughs>